Um, and next we have Susan Wild with the uh, impacts of novel cyanotoxin on fauna in the southeast. Hello. So I, I have a video toward the beginning of my talk, and I hope it works because I think that if you watch that, it'll it will help uh, explain this better. So we'll see if that works. Are you advancing my slide? Yeah, give us a second. There, yeah. there. I will review a little bit for those of you who haven't heard me talk previously. This research has been funded by the Small Grants Program over the years, and we really appreciate that funding. Got us over the hump. Next slide. There it went. We finally were able to publish the uh, research that we've been doing for about, for me, about 20 years, but um, for the other researchers, uh, about 10 in a collaboration to try to completely characterize this novel toxin that was killing eagles originally in Arkansas. And next slide. I don't know if I'm doing it or you're doing it. I'll see if this will show up. The AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize, our oldest award, recognizes an outstanding original research paper published in science each year. The winning paper is chosen based on the quality of its scholarship, innovation, presentation, likelihood of influencing its field, and its wider interdisciplinary significance. This year, we present the prize to the paper entitled Hunting the Ego Killer, a cyanobacterial neurotoxin causes vacular myelinopathy first published March 26, 2021. The paper was the product of an international collaboration co-led by Susan Wild, Associate Professor of Aquatic Science at the University of Georgia, and Timo Niedermeyer, Professor of Pharmacognosy at Martin Luther University, Halle Wittenberg in Germany. At De Grey Lake, Arkansas, in fall 1994, a mass die-off of bald eagles initiated a wildlife investigation. Dozens of birds died, and many displayed odd behavior, like missing their perches and flying into rock walls. When wildlife biologists examined dead eagles, they found extensive lesions throughout their brains and spinal cords. By 1998, scientists knew that birds from at least 10 different southeastern reservoirs in five states had this new disease called vacular myelinopathy, or VM, but no one knew the cause. In addition to avian species, Susan Wilde and UGA colleagues documented that VM could affect amphibians, reptiles, and fish. Researchers made gradual progress on covering the cause. Wilde and her colleagues in South Carolina, where many of the birds suffered from VM, found dense growth of the invasive plant Hydrilla verticillata. The plant, imported from India for use in aquariums, was overrunning man-made lakes in the southeast readily consumed by coots, which are frequently eaten by bald eagles. Using fluorescence microscopy, Wilde observed that in affected water bodies, hydrilla leaves were densely covered with cyanobacteria colonies. This novel cyanobacterium was also found in all the reservoirs where the birds had died. Wilde and her colleagues speculated that the cyanobacterium produced a toxin responsible for the eagle deaths. They fed plants collected from affected water bodies to laboratory birds confirming the plants colonized by cyanobacteria caused VM. The cyanobacterium was named Autochtonos hydrolicola, Greek for ego killer living on hydrilla. However, no known toxin was detected in the cyanobacterium. In Germany, Niedermeyer and co-authors grew this cyanobacterium in the lab. However, lab cultured bacteria did not cause VM in test chickens. Hypothesizing that the toxin might be produced in lakes, but not in the lab, they collected more hydrilla leaves from impacted lakes. Direct analysis of the cyanobacteria growing on these leaves revealed a compound not present in lab-grown autochtonos that contained five bromine atoms. The team was able to reproduce the compound in the lab when the cyanobacteria were grown in the presence of bromide. The compound was revealed to be a novel biindole alkaloid and further experiments confirmed it causes VM. The scientists called the compound autochtonotoxin toxin that kills the eagle. Jana Marisch at the Biology Center of the Czech Academy of Sciences led the genome sequencing of Autochtonos hydrolicola, which allowed the identification of the compound's biosynthetic gene cluster. 
bromide can leach from rocks, but it can also be introduced into the environment from human activities such as coal-fueled power plants or water treatment facilities. The authors recommended increasing monitoring and public awareness campaigns be implemented for hydrilla and autoctonotoxin to protect both wildlife and human health. The study brought researchers together from multiple countries and disciplines to solve a decades-old mystery and reminds us how dangerous human-induced changes to ecosystems can be. These unanticipated effects are only likely to increase as we continue to alter the world around us. Hunting the Eagle Killer, a cyanobacterial neurotoxin causes vacular myelinopathy, recipient of this year's AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize. Moving forward to the next slide. So when I first started working on avian vacular myelinopathy or AVM back in 2001, uh, we, we knew eagles were dying from this disease. They, they died at the first outbreak in Arkansas, to Gray Lake, Arkansas. Um, but we also lost great horned owls that had territories on these reservoirs, as well as lots of American coots that fly down and, and many are herbivorous and omnivorous waterfowl using this reservoirs, uh, also develop the same type of lesions in their brains, as well as this Canada goose that this hunter is holding. Uh, after studying the hydrilla that I collected from a lot of different lakes where birds were sick, um, found a new species of cyanobacteria that was actually growing on the hydrilla itself on the underside of the leaf. And since it was a new genus and a new species, we got to name it. So we named it Eagle Killer Living on Hydrilla. So this harmful cyanobacteria was growing on invasive aquatic species at all of our existing AVM sites. And you can actually see it on the underside of the leaf uh, if if you if it's growing densely enough but i verified it under the microscope by mounting the whole leaf upside down um, and then using epifluorescence illumination so that um, we can eliminate regular light and just see the pigments shining from the autofluorescence of the cyanobacteria so this gives us a way to visualize this new species that um, grows mysteriously only on the underside of the leaf and seems to grow without any other um, cyanobacteria present on the leaves. And we've seen the distribution of this Autochthonus hydrilla expand uh, as well as of course the hydrilla distribution is expanding and I'll talk a little bit about whether or not they're co-invading. I think that's certainly a possibility once they're here but they're also it's also possible that this cyanobacteria was present but did not have such a wonderful substrate to grow on until the invasive aquatic plants took over these man-made impoundments. But it took us a while to be able to fully characterize the toxin. So initially, unfortunately, we had to use sentinel mallards or chicken feeding trials to see whether or not the hydrilla that we were collecting from a reservoir was toxic. This sentinel mallard was uh, in a lake where it had access to hydrilla with the toxic cyanobacteria and has the classic symptoms of vacular myelinopathy where it's having a seizure and eventually is, is tremors and then paralysis. We do euthanize these birds as soon as they are found to be this sick. So initially we were using our chickens uh, sort of as a gold standard to determine whether or not material was actually toxic since we didn't have a way to quantify that toxin since we didn't know what it was yet. We were using um, the also, Syria daphnia and the larval zebrafish more recently to be able to uh, find which, which potential compound among the many compounds that would have been in the hydrilla plus that cyanobacteria that's collected from the field. The zebrafish uh, 
are used for a lot of tox assays for unknown um, toxicants because they share a lot of our genetic material and their response to a toxin, is, a neurotoxin is very similar to what happens to the birds. They have trouble turning themselves upright. If, uh, if they get upside down, they're just sort of flipping their little pectoral fins. And uh, this is after just a short uh, bath exposure of the new toxin. They also had uh, high mortality um, when we were exposing them uh, in these water baths. So we, we came up with these uh, mortality curves for replicate zebrafish so that we could determine what their response was to a given concentration of the toxin. So as I said, this material collected from the field, the hydrilla plus anything else associated with it, gives you an HPLC trace that's very messy. But um, luckily the toxin uh, is a very large peak and we were able to confirm that that peak alone caused neuropathy um, and mortality for both the Seriodaphnia and the zebrafish. So we had an easier way to be able to tell whether or not a sample is toxic. <clears throat> and we, our collaborators in Germany were growing some of this new species of cyanobacteria in their laboratory, and they grew up a large batch of it, and we went ahead and gavaged the chickens with it. We, we fed that to chickens directly, and it didn't cause any neuropathy or any lesions. So we got a little worried about that, but um, as we learned that there was actually bromide in this molecule, um, Stefan, the PhD student, tried adding the bromide to the culture media, and then that new toxin was produced. And we've also found, oops, I got a little ahead of that. I'll, I need to tell you that what the structure looks like, but we found this autochthonotoxin in the wild coot tissues that we collected from uh, Clarks Hill or Strom Thurmond in uh, fairly high concentrations in breast and thigh tissue. And when we did the uh, chicken trial with that, um, the extract from hydrilla and whatever was in the field, we got the same type of responses we got from the purified toxin that was from that cyanobacteria. So we saw the lesions that were in the cere cerebellum, cerebellar tracts, and in the optic region as well as under the electron microscopy, you could see that this was an intramyelinetic edema, which is the specific type of vacular myelinopathy that the eagles had initially. We have done a number of trials and with uh, some of the other uh, parts of this aquatic food web and, and many of these trials were with a lot of undergrad and graduate students and supported by the small grants program. But we have demonstrated that Fish are vulnerable to the toxin um, when consuming it directly. Uh, the salamanders were exposed by trophic transfer when they consume fish or snails or tadpoles that have been gut loaded with hydrilla. The frog little tadpoles ate it directly and died. We have recovered um, some beavers from AVM lakes and seen under light microscopy that they have similar lesions, but we really need to have the electron microscopy for that definitive lesion um, detail. So I, I do think mammals will be affected, but we don't have that uh, evidence yet that I, that I could be able to publish on. So we're still working on that. We have um, seen turtles affected by this, as well as obviously many kinds of birds. And the snakes also got it through trophic transfer of consuming gut-loaded prey. Uh, we also know that these game fish that people are consuming from Clarks Hill not only have the toxin in their GI tract, which we had, we had suspected previously, but also in muscle tissue fillets that people would consume. So we need a management solution for this problem. And one of the, um, there's several different ways to get rid of hydrilla and all of them are not very good, but 
certainly using chemical control um, has been effective if you have enough money and you can really keep after it, but that can be very expensive. And in this case, um, we're not recommending the use of any um, chemicals in the fall when the cyanotoxin could be produced if you add some bromide to the water or if you kill the hydrilla plants because they are hyperaccumulating bromide. Strangely, they have like 300 times the amount of bromide that's in the water in the plant tissue. So it might explain why Atoctinus likes to grow on uh, hydrilla and other submerged aquatic plants so much. So we had, even in uh, Okeechobee, we had quite a bit of bromide that was in the sediment and then concentrated in hydrilla leaves, but we don't have a top venus growing there. In Clarks Hill, we saw an accumulation of it in the hydrilla as well. So uh, I think this is a, a means by which these cyanobacteria can get those vital bromide ions so that it can make that toxin molecule. And we have used grass carp to remove hydrilla in a situation where the, this cyanobacteria is growing on it and found that when those fish were fed to the chickens that we didn't see lesion development in chickens, but the grass carp did develop lesions and smaller grass carp that we did studies on in the lab actually had pretty high mortality. The larger grass carp seemed to be able to survive consuming the hydrilla and eliminating it. So just to uh, summarize a little bit before I go on to some of our current research, we, we now know that this new toxin, and we called it atoctonotoxin as eagle killer toxin, is neurotoxic, lipophilic, so that's not water soluble. Most cyanotoxins are water soluble, so you would assume though, even though there might be a dangerous bloom, that that will dissipate pretty quickly once it dies back. But in this case, a uh, lipid soluble toxin can be concentrated in biological tissues and could accumulate over time in wild game and fish. So we consider these AVM reservoirs an ecological trap. Hydrilla grows in lots of places across the US and not all of them have autochthonos on it. In fact, we have not found it in that many locations relative to the number of locations where hydrilla occurs. But when it does, it seems like really attractive habitat and it attracts a lot of water birds. And then the eagles will move in and set up territories over the fall and winter during that time. They're uh, exposed to toxin throughout that breeding season and their nests fail. So I am concerned about the fact that now I gotta worry about game birds being at risk. This is not you know, something that's just affecting some of these unhunted species. And aquatic mammals uh, appear to be at risk. We've certainly found several dead beavers in our newest AVM site. Now, are the fish and waterfowl living in these reservoirs safe to consume? I don't think so, but I don't have the data yet to tell people not to. So I am trying at this point to push as fast as I can to get more data on mammalian susceptibility, because I do think we need to come up with a consumption advisory that is very much like we would use for uh, PCBs or mercury here in Georgia. And the Georgia um, DNR uh, fisheries guys are collecting a lot of fish for us so that we also have fish tissues to do uh, the concentration of this atoctonotoxin in the different reservoirs that they're looking at for fish consumption advisories. I have a few more slides here and, and I think I'm still doing okay on time. I'll show you this. Uh, Maldi MS is a really cool technique where it allows you to look at the hydrilla leaf again, sort of like I did under the microscope, but then this can look in a very specific section of this slide and show you the exact like isotopic signature of atoctonotoxin. So confirming that um, that toxin is produced by the cyanobacteria growing on the hydrilla. And now that um, Timo and some of the folks in the Czech Republic have fully characterized this toxin and now can synthesize it. We can 
do these trials with a known dose of purified toxin. And so that is our next step is to do the mammalian dosing trials. And just as a teaser, it doesn't look like, I mean, our talk thinners can grow on other submerged aquatic plants, certainly a Jeria densa, Eurasian water milfoil, some of the pond weeds. But it was really weird when I found it growing on pine needles that were submerged in these uh, reservoirs and water willow, which is something we've been trying to replant to, you know, have some habitat in these reservoirs where we want to eliminate the hydrilla that's toxic but still leave something for fish and wildlife. And those colonies look just like my colonies growing on hydrilla. So which came first? Did it grow on the pine needles and then start growing on the hydrilla or vice versa? More work to be done. Something that happened recently that was sort of interesting in terms of finding new sites and getting more people interested, it was this Covington Pond in uh, Georgia, where it's an 80 acre uh, water supply lake. They pull water in from the Okmogi and then fill it. And it's 80 acres of hydrilla. And the a number of water birds using this was outstanding. Like this is just the ruddy ducks, like 340 ruddy ducks on this pond. So I said, wow, I bet that has hydrilla. And it did a lot. And then suddenly they disappeared as soon as it got cold. And I had a lot of feather piles and a lot of predator scats. So these are systems that I want people to understand <laughs> that if they see something like this, what does hydrilla look like? And what is a reasonable density of water birds in such a place. So I have, I put this into the uh, iNaturalist, but I was hoping that I, as I give talks, I'm encouraging more of the people watching to be more mindful of like, of, a, of the plant if infestation like this and try to keep up reporting on them because I think will help all of us. And I am grateful for all of the the web work that has been done to get more sightings. And I have lots of people to acknowledge um, for the, all the help on this. I certainly could not have done it alone. And there's been a number of funding sources over the last 20 years, but I must say that the small grants program kept us going at a time when we still had so many questions that um, regular grant systems didn't quite know how to uh, fund that, more like a wild goose chase, so. I'm going to leave time for questions, I hope, if anyone has any. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Yeah, there is time for questions, if anybody has any. Um, it's really important, impactful work that you're doing. So, do you have any questions? <clears throat> oh, we got one question here. Hi, thank you for that talk. That was very interesting. Um, so it sounds like controlling hydrilla isn't necessarily going to address the problem if, if this cyanobacteria lives in other places. I mean, do you think that this is something that's always been around in, in the environment and we're just, now we're just more aware of it? And do you, uh, I think do you, that's a possibility, but it's sort of like a dose response, right? When you're doing a feeding trial, you know, if you don't have a high density of this cyanobacteria, it might not really matter because it's not, the way that hydrilla grows in a, that like that 80 acre city pond, it, it is completely full of hydrilla biomass from the sediment to the surface and into the coast. So that's a lot of toxin produce. I would say that with water willow and the pine needles, that's just not going to have the same potential for trophic transfer and moving on up. So while I do think there's potential that both autochthonous and hydrilla are invading together and separately, or, you know, is that we're not, I don't think we're going to be able to find and kill the cyanobacteria. The only thing I know right now is that we have a dense enough infestation of, say, these invasive aquatic plants that they host enough of this cyanobacteria to cause a lot of wildlife death. 